again. My name is Diogenes. I'm the coordinator for the series of lecture in English and other languages, it's all in English. And um, today we are going to have our fifth lecture and it's going to be uh, delivered by Robson Ribeiro. Robson is a former student of ours and uh, he's now a PhD student at um, Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. But um, Clarissa is a colleague of mine. You know, she's a professor at uh, Wesby. She's going to be the moderator and she's going to uh, present uh, our speaker, okay? Um, I'd like to remind you to please sign out, sign up your the list. All right, otherwise you won't receive your certificate if you don't. So be sure to fill out the form, okay, before, uh, before you leave. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, Clarissa, the moderator of this lecture. Her name is Clarissa Costa Silva. She's currently an assistant professor at Wesby where she's been engaged in developing and hosting an English conversation group named Communication Café since 2014. She graduated in Letras, English from Unimontes. She is specialized uh, in English language teaching from UFMG and holds a master's in applied linguistics from UFU. She was once a visiting scholar at University of Saskatchewan in Canada and a foreign language assistant of, of Portuguese at University of Iowa. She has taught English for over 16 years now, and she has taught at private um, language school, public schools, and at, at university settings. Among her research interests are the diverse universe of stories or narratives of students and teachers, and the endless curiosity around developing communicative skills in the English language. Okay, so um, now Clarissa is going to take the floor to moderate uh, the lecture. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Professor Yes, for this introduction. And thank you for inviting me as well to host this conversation today with Hobson. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I hope you can all hear me good. <laughs> um, first of all, I think we, we would like to thank you also for coming up with this idea of Sol in English. Um, it's very exciting to think that we have such a thing at the university, at Wesby. So I think we're all very proud of your project and we hope that we have many more years ahead of us. Um, uh, so today our guest for um, this series of lecture is Robson Ribeiro da Silva. And um, he, you, you'll be seeing him here very soon, of course. Uh, I would like to introduce Robson briefly um, Professor Diogenes introduced myself, like he said, I teach English at Wesby. And again, it, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, Robson. So welcome. <laughs> we from Wesby welcome you uh, to this lecture today. And we are very curious and very excited to, to have you here as the other guests we have had before, so that you can share with us your thoughts, your findings, your research findings. And the theme is very, I think, for all English teachers, it's also very exciting. So we are all curious to hear from you. So thank you for being here with us. Yes. Um, so I'll briefly introduce uh, Robson based on his latches, like what he has available there. And if he wants, he can, of course, add something else. But this is just a brief um a brief description, right, of some of the things that Hobson has worked with or studied or uh, some of his interests. And it's nice because it connects a lot to what he's doing now and what, he, what he'll be talking to us about. 
right? So uh, Hobson holds a degree in social communications, a master's in applied linguistics, and he's currently a PhD student in English linguistics at Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. He's a member of the Phonetics and Phonology Applied to Second Language Research Group uh, in the Laboratory of Applied Phonetics. His most recent project called English, Inglês para Musicus consists of a series of workshops and open mic sessions designed to help amateur and professional musicians to refine their pronunciation skills for singing. So this is just briefly some of the things that Hobson has uh, worked with and some of the interests he's, he has had to. Uh, and like I said before, it connects a lot to uh, the chosen title for his uh, lecture today, which is Musical Aptitude and Pronunciation Skills. Is there a relationship? So we are all very curious to hear from you in your experiences. I think as English teachers, we carry a suitcase of experiences with us. And when we, it's about music, especially when it's about music, I remember my students always asking, when are you bringing a song to, to class? So I think for most of us, this is the question we hear the most. Um, and of course, for us as teachers, we want to have a purpose for bringing something. And it's good to see how you're going to tell us a little bit about how we uh, you can use music as a tool and how it can be done, how it can work, what are the things, the intri intricacies around this theme. So again, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing your thoughts and findings in advance. So you can take the stage and if you need us, just raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Clarissa. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be um, talking to so many um, uh, dear students and professors who helped me to be where I am right now. So I'm very enthusiastic about um, what I'm going to share with you now, even though I don't have, like you said, like many research findings right now, because uh, part of the, the lecture is going to be about my my research, but uh, it's going to be most specifically about my my interests because uh, the funny thing is it's it's been it's always been like right in, in, in front of me, but I never thought I could connect like uh, pronunciation research, phonetics, phonology, and and music, mm -hmm. and um, I find a way to to join two of my greatest passions, and I'm very enthusiastic to. You know, share um, share a little bit about uh, what I'm what I'm up to, what I've been up to uh, lately. Uh, well, although the relationship between music and language uh, has intrigued philosophers for many centuries, uh, only recently researchers, uh, most specifically from psycholinguistics and, and neurolinguistics, have focused on finding evidence on the shared mechanisms. Uh, for language, uh, music, and processing. So this is uh, basically what, what I'm going to talk about, uh, about the relationship between um, language and music, according to research, how musical aptitude is measured, how it can be differentiated from music skill, um, and also uh, how we can connect uh, musical aptitude and second language acquisition research. Uh, I'm briefly going to talk about my my project, which is uh, English para músicos, that you briefly mentioned, uh, uh, which is basically uh, English pronunciation for for musicians, and a little bit of my uh, PhD uh, research proposal. So I hope uh, I hope you enjoy. So if you have any questions, you can um, leave them in in the chat box because I'm going to try to answer as as many as uh, the time. LLs. Okay, so I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation with you all now. Okay, and the title of this presentation is Musical Aptitude and Pronunciation Skills. Is there a relationship? Well, uh, I'd like to introduce myself uh, more properly. 
So besides um, holding a degree in journalism, I recently completed um, a bachelor's degree in uh, Portuguese uh, language. I did a master's degree in uh, language teaching at the Language Culture Graduate Program at UFBA. And right now I'm a PhD candidate in English Linguistics uh, at the, the, the English Graduate Program at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And I'm working with second language acquisition, phonetics, uh, phonology. And my main areas of interest now are uh, second language uh, acquisition, uh, phonetics, phonology, music, and of course, how um, those can um, relate to, to language education. So um, those are my uh, main research interests and passion. Okay, as some of you know, uh, why music? Some of you might be asking. Uh, well, I think the reason why I decided to bring um, this topic to my to my research is because of the you know uh, five year musical experience that I had singing in a, a quartet, which is looking like a quintet, the soul jazz, which uh, some of you uh, might be familiarized with. Even though we we didn't get to play like at like a big venues. <laughs> So I think we were like for five years, we were not as, uh, let's say, as, as well known because we, we were not playing at many venues. But I think that everybody who attended our, you know, small concerts and musical presentations uh, enjoyed uh, our music. So this is one of my main inspirations. And before uh, my talk officially starts, I like to hear from you. In your opinion, does musical aptitude or skill acquired from training make you a better language learner? So I'd like to know your opinion about that. It is also acknowledged that are that are many variables in a second language uh, acquisition research that need to be taken into consideration, such as the learners. Um, uh, first language linguistic uh, background, uh, the age they start learning, as well as language engagement, which is uh, how much you get to interact in that uh, language. Because there is a myth, for instance, that uh, like residence abroad or studying abroad is enough to make you fluent in a language. But some researchers now they defend that. Um, just the fact that you moved somewhere where the target language is spoken as the you know first and main language is not enough to make you fluent in the language. So you need language uh, engagement to engage in interaction. So this is um, a variable in second language acquisition that researchers are are taking a look at. Motivation is an important one as well. And together with uh, musical aptitude and training, uh, a lot has been said about um, working memory. And also, uh, in my field, it, it is really important to understand um, the, the, the interfaces between the mother language and the second language uh, phonetic inventory or proximity. But the variable that I'm particularly interested in now as a researcher is musical aptitude and also uh, musical skill. So uh, this leads us back to, to the question that I just uh, asked uh, a while ago. Can uh, musical aptitude influence pronunciation skills or second language acquisition uh, in general? So can it be a good predictor of second language acquisition? Well, um, first I'd like to bring you here some uh, thoughts from uh, researchers uh, on the relationship between um, music and language as, uh, as it regards their like similarities, for instance. Uh, what strikes uh, researchers and people in general um, is how similar music and language can be from a, like from a sonic point of view. So according to uh, Slavk, for instance, speech and music are the most impressive examples of our ability to make sense out of sound. There is a hypothesis um, that nowadays is named the like, music, 
uh, music language hypothesis that uh, claim that language and music, they have like a common ancestor and then they sort of like split and became like two uh, independent phenomenon and music would like emphasize sound as emotive meaning, whereas language would emphasize sound as referential uh, meaning. But among musicologists nowadays, um, the let's say that the prevalent thought is that music and language, although they share many similarities, they evolved from different ancestors. That is, they, they are completely like uh, independent phenomenon, right? But the, the issue remains unresolved. Okay, some, as I said before, similarities that can be found in uh, music regards the, the acoustic parameters. If we, if we speak of like, um, like the speech signal, like spoken language. So according to uh, Schobert, and Benson, 2013, music and speech are complex auditory signals based on the same acoustic parameters, like frequency, duration, intensity, and timbre, like color. Um, and for Patel, uh, music is a phenomenon like language consisting of perceptual discrete elements organized into hierarchically structured sequences. Uh, well, and the levels of organization of, of language as structure would be like morphology, phonology, semantics, syntax, pragmatics, uh, as we know. And music would also have like uh, st uh, structural uh, components that could be um, that could be comparable to to music. For example, like rhythm, uh, melody, uh, harmony. And even like, like like timbre, so we we have like the the timbres and the different colors of the like musical tones and, and notes. The same way that, for example, we can also say it is usually said that vowels they have like different uh, colors because of the different frequencies they are consisted of. So we can also talk about uh, uh, vowel. Uh, let's say we sometimes we say like vowel qualities, which is the which the, the color. The acoustic color that each vowel uh, has and, and how we perceive, right? A lot has been talked about uh, the influence of like, music to to language, uh, and it seems that musical expertise influenced not only first language, um, but also second language processing, uh, perception, and production. And there are some. Uh, some scholars who say that if you were exposed to like music, if you had like like few months of uh, exposure to music, that can influence the way that you perceive sounds around you. And the more exposure you you get, the more uh, training you undergo. So the the more refined will be your perceptual uh, skills. But what is rare? This really caught my attention. Is uh, a lot has been talked about the possible effects of uh, music on language acquisition, uh, perception, but uh, we still uh, need to see studies investigating uh, the influence of of like the, the 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 reverse, like how like acquiring different languages can influence like the the, the learning of of music, maybe. So I, I would be really interested in, uh, in uh, taking a look at, at that. Um, usually there's uh, some evidence, like common sense and evidence that um, people who have musical skills or aptitudes or know how to learn how, how to play an instrument, they usually uh, outperform uh, non-musicians or people who have never exposed themselves to music in uh, perceptual tasks, such uh, perceiving uh, duration and frequency in discrimination tasks, perception of intonation. So some researchers have found out that uh, musicians or people who have musical experience or aptitude are better at perceiving like uh, different patterns of prosody and also, uh, musicians seem to outperform 
non-musicians in perceiving specific sounds in noisy environments, according to Barbary Clark. And uh, there is another research evidence from Brandler and Ramsayer from 2003 that musicians uh, performed better uh, at memory tasks than people who never had any kind of musical uh, experience. And what I find really interesting about um, this relationship between music and, and, and language is that um, the same way that the nature versus nurture debate pervades uh, discussions in language, uh, we can find the same in music because uh, it is really difficult to, to determine, uh, for example, how, how are you going to determine like musical aptitude, for instance, and, uh, and, and its relationship with musical training? Because there are people who, for example, they start learning music, like the same time they have around the same age, they go through the same amount of training. And after five years, there's one who gets to perform better, like um, compared to, 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 to their fellow. So because of, because of such evidence, it is thought that there is something that is called like a uh, talent or a natural aptitude both for um, like learning music. It's not that everybody, it's not that you can't learn music unless you, you excel at, at it, but it seems that there are people who have, let's say, um, uh, uh, an intelligence for, you know, performing better at music than at other domains, for instance. And the same goes for language, right? So I, I, I don't think I need to focus too much on that because I think this uh, debate will last for as long as as we live because it's 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 really difficult to determine how much of language is associated to cognition and how much of it is it tri triggered by the the environment. Right? We know that both cognition and the environment is um, are really important for for shaping languages, and the same goes for like uh, music or musical aptitude and skill. So I think that before moving any further, uh, I make a strong case to um, try to explain, based on my understanding, the difference between musical aptitude and musical uh, skill. So according to Talamini, uh, an Italian researcher, um, musical aptitude would be a, a natural talent or maybe an inborn talent for perceiving and discriminating musical sounds, such as melodies, chords, rhythms, and so on. And musical skill would be uh, um, an ability that you acquire from training, whether self-taught training by yourself, going to a musical school, you know, or just like dabbling uh, in music. For instance, I, well, I never took like a musical aptitude test even though I'll, I'll start like testing some, but I would say that myself, I, I think I'm more like skilled because I, I've been through this experience than, than aptitude because compared to other friends of mine, I noticed that there are people who have, uh, who can, uh, let's say, perceive sounds and, and, and chords and even uh, produce like vocal harmonies like a lot easier than, than I can. For example, learning how to harmonize when singing like took me, took me months and I cannot do it like naturally because some people just, you know, some people never studied music. For example, I, I, I had a bit of music training, but I know like some of my uh, musician friends, they, they never went to like a musical school. And it's, it's so amazing how, how easily they can uh, uh, like harmonize and, and uh, singing, let's say, different, let's say, harmonies uh, to the melody. I don't, I don't know how to explain this <laughs> more, more easily, but yeah, some people seem to, to be born with a uh, special talent, which uh, according to my own assessment, I don't think I have that, that kind of aptitude, right? Okay, so you might be curious now on how uh, musical aptitude can be, can be measured. 
Uh, throughout time, several different musical aptitude tests have been uh, developed, and they consist of uh, very short auditory, melodic, and rhythmic sequences. And you have like uh, like a pair of stimuli, and you have to judge such pair as same or or different. So most uh, musical aptitude uh, tests they they consist of, of this pattern, right? So yeah, some, some of them measure like different musical components. Uh, for example, the, the earliest one I, I could track was the seashore test, which is a musical aptitude test that we, we see a lot in research. It was uh, last updated in 1960, and it, it is consisted of like six different sub tests. Uh, there's a uh, subtests of rhythm, pitch, loudness, like meter, which is, I think, similar to rhythm somehow, but the timbre, like the different colors, like C, E, C, D, E, F, etc., and also tonal memory, which I, I don't know exactly what that, what that, what that means. Um, and then there's also uh, uh, a little bit of a more modern one which is the Gordon Musical Aptitude uh, Profile. And this one was, was designed for uh, different like age groups. So you have like the primary measures, the intermediate and the advanced measures. So um, the primary measures was designed for like um, younger people, intermediate for teenagers and advanced measures for, for adults. And it basically consists of two subtests, one of like pitch, like sound pitch and rhythm. Okay, there's another one by Wink, which is very uh, similar to, to the seashore. It consists of many, many subtests. But um, by revisiting the literature, I found a paper that showed one that is available online that is called the Profile of Musical Perception Skills. Uh, by Law and Zentner, I think they they come. Those are researchers. I think they are cognitive or psycholinguistic researchers, and they developed this uh, test in 2012. It's a very recent one. They are still um, testing, and it is consisted by four like subtests. Um, and here I explain a little bit more of what those subtests are according to my to my uh, understanding. So the melody uh, is made of stimuli, made of melodies of constant rhythm. So you want to hear melody, not rhythm. Uh, the tuning would be uh, the perception of the, the, the let's say, the, 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 the colors of the different, uh, let's say, the, the different notes. And you basically have to identify and assess like how many notes are being played and sometimes like the order that they are being um, played. There's also like a speed one, uh, which vary from one to seven beats per minute. And they can be either made of like synthetic or, um, or a real like recorded musical sample. And there's also like the beat, um, which is consisted of stimuli of uh, rhythmic patterns of clicks with different uh, intensities. So I think the beat would be like the rhythm. So it would test your your rhythm perception in in music. Okay, so this was, uh, like I said, I didn't take the full test, but as I am testing different musical aptitude tests, so um, this was my result. Uh, well, I'm still trying to figure out what what especially the second column in all those combined results so i i don't know what maybe the sound perception and the timing would be like more more easily uh inferable but i don't know exactly what the structure on the sensory means so i'm still trying to figure out what those combined results uh, mean but as you can see in the first column so this was just uh, like a sample test was like a three minute test because i, I wanted to to have an idea what the test would uh, sound like. So as you can see, my, my scores were not like really high. Maybe I think this, the speed was, was the best one. So I got seven, 75. 
And the, the most interesting thing about uh, measuring musical aptitude is that it is really difficult to find like a threshold because, uh, well, musical aptitude is, is made of like different subcomponents and you, you get like higher and lower scores and you cannot simply say that somebody has or, or does not have musical aptitude. Usually you, you measure that in, in, in terms of like levels. So you have like lower and higher level of, of musical aptitude, which in my opinion uh, makes uh, a lot of sense. So this is the link to this musical aptitude test if anyone is interested. And that's probably the one that I'm going to use um, in my study, unless I find something more, more convincing. Okay, I brought two research uh, evidence here. And the first one that I'd like to talk to you about, it was a paper that inspired um, the whole study, which is a paper which was written by uh, Gottfried in uh, 2007. Uh, and I came across it like last year, it was like really, uh, really recent. And in this paper, um, he measured um, the ability of uh, Americans like uh, perceiving and producing um, sounds in Mandarin Chinese. So they contrasted, they divided the participants like in, 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 in two groups and they compared the performance of musical college students and non-musicians in, as I said, perceiving um, sounds, tones actually in Mandarin Chinese. I don't know uh, if anyone here has ever had any contact uh, with, with Chinese, but as linguists, we know that uh, tones in Chinese, they, they are like phonemic. They are really important. They are not like mere like musicality, intonation. So uh, I don't know if everybody can, can see it. Right, so I don't know if I'm able, like I took a, a semester Chinese, but I don't know if I'll be able to produce those, um, those tones properly. So you have like a, a, a segmental sequence, the ma, so you, if you change the, the melody, you're not just changing like pragmatics, like your, your intention, but you're actually changing uh, semantics. If you try to say something like ma, so you're saying mother. If you say ma, you're saying him. But if you say ma, you say horse. And if you say ma, you say uh, reprimand, right? So I think this is really, really amazing. So that's, uh, those were, I wouldn't say the words, but that was what was investigated, right? So the first experiment, so yeah, in the study there were like two uh, different, um, uh, ph phonetic tasks. So the first one involved 38 uh, US Americans and they had to determine the direction of uh, like a sine wave uh, tone by identifying the four uh, distinctive tones in Mandarin that I just talked to you about. And um, this author concluded after administering this experiment that musicians perform significantly better than non-musicians in identifying the, the tones in perceiving those. And the second one was uh, an imitation task, actually, because um, those Americans, they had no uh, prior knowledge uh, of, of Chinese. So this second experiment was like, like mere like imitation. So in this uh, task, the, the author wanted to investigate whether musicians would uh, discriminate and uh, consequently imitate unfamiliar tones, you know, better than uh, non-musicians. And once again, uh, all listeners, they showed more difficulties in the discriminating, like the mid-rising and the low dipping tones, and that musicians, they showed more, more accuracy uh, in producing those tones, sorry, in, in discriminating and perceiving those sounds, tones. And once again, musicians were rated by judges, uh, rated as more like target-like than the non-musicians. Uh, so musicians in this case, they were able to 
imitate unfamiliar sounds in a native-like manner better than uh, non non musicians, which I find really really interesting, right? So uh, a study like uh, Gottfried is not actually saying that. Uh, Mus musical aptitude, in this case training, that musical training uh, determines like the way you're going to acquire, uh, perceive and produce sounds in a, in a, in a different language. But there, there is like a, a, a correlation, right? At least in his study. Okay, so I try to find like a more recent one, like two other studies, one by Milanov, who uh, is a, a Finnish, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Finnish uh, researcher. And this one is like more that the previous one was more like second language acquisition. And this one is more, uh, let's say, uh, language education, because in this study, um, they wanted to uh, investigate the role of musical aptitude in discriminating and producing uh, English minimal pairs by Finnish adults. So uh, participants in the study were like uh, 46 uh, Finnish female adults, right-handed, probably because they, <laughs> that there might be some, let's say, psycholinguistic effect, which is not my area. And in this study, even though uh, it is a recent one, they resorted to, uh, to an older uh, musical aptitude test. And by the numbers here, you can, we, we can already see that uh, the musical choir members, because uh, they were split in different groups, they seem to have uh, obtained the higher scores in, in this test compared to the non-musicians and even to uh, English philology uh, students, okay? Uh, well, these are um, the, you know, the, the, let's say the statistics and the, the means that the participants uh, obtained in each uh, different uh, subtest, right? Which I think is, is a lot of information. So we can go to this, uh, well, before showing you the, 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 the plots, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the speech elicitation task that they used. So they the participants were required to uh, produce uh, 30 words containing these meaningful pairs here in let's say more British English because I think this is like more 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 dominant in uh, Europe so they, they focus on that and the main finding was that uh, the non-musician university students had more difficulty in performing this task uh, compared to the other groups compared to the musician and to the to the philology linguistic uh, students. Okay, so I, I find the, these spots here very, um, very explanatory and really interesting because um, in this study, it was observed, uh, it was observed uh, that musical training affected uh, most pronunci pronunciation of, of participants production than perception. For example, when uh, when producing the sounds, so the, um, the non-musical university students, let's say they produced um, more, I wouldn't say like errors, but um, more non-target like forms, let's put it this way, as compared to the philology and the, the, the music uh, students. But what I found was it was really interesting was that even though a musical aptitude test usually measures your perception of different musical components, this study didn't find uh, a major effect for, for perception, right? Because they had a, a production and a discrimination of perception task. So for the, for the production task, um, the, the non, musical students produced uh, more non-target-like forms, but for the discrimination task, um, there was like no uh, statistically significant effect uh, among the three groups. And I found this was particularly interesting because I wouldn't have uh, predicted it. It would probably um, not conform, let's say one of my hypotheses and, and objectives. 
it would not confirm. So in short, those were the, the main findings of the previous study that I just talked to you about. So a correlation was found between general musical aptitude and pronunciation skills. Um, there's also here another correlation. So the higher the scores in, in, the, in the musical aptitude tests, uh, the better their pronunciation skills or the more target-like um, they sounded. And the last one, which I just mentioned and really surprised me, was that the discrimination skill did not correlate with either the, the musical aptitude scores or the pronunciation performance. And the last study, which was, I believe, the most recent one that I, I, I read, it's a study by, uh, by uh, an Italian uh, researcher from 2018. And uh, actually, a group of researchers, they wanted to investigate the role of musical training, so in this case, skill, uh, in the performance of a dictation and a grammar task uh, in English by Italian children. So for this study, they had 41 students with a musical experience and 39 non-musicians. So um, they used the, the prompts, um, the, the most recent musical aptitude test that I could track and the one that I also mentioned, which consists of four subtests. Uh, they also used uh, an intelligence test for, for some reason, and two um, different tasks, like a, like a grammar uh, uh, ELT uh, task or test, uh, consists of, consisted of 25 items, and uh, a dictation task uh, consisted of 30 unrelated uh, concrete words. And here again, there are like the scores that they uh, obtain for each test for the different subtests of, uh, of the prompts, the total, the intelligence tests, uh, the grammar test as well, as well as the, the dictation elicitation tasks. So I believe that this is a, a lot to, <laughs> to process even, even for me but we can discuss a little bit the main findings uh, of the previous studies. Um, as regard the syntax, the grammar um, task, uh, the authors did not find uh, a significant main effect of either group or the test. And once again, musicians outdid non-musicians, but it was not very statistically significant. And as for dictation task, there was not, uh, there was no significant main effect of the musical aptitude test, but there was a significant effect of the of the group. And in this case, for the for the production dictation um, task, musicians outdid non musicians significantly. So there there seems to be um, a positive correlation according to the previous studies and this one uh, between higher levels of musical aptitude or maybe longer periods of training and pronunciation um, production especially production but not necessarily reception okay um well right now before talking to you about my my research that I that I'm working on right now I'd like to share with you now a project that some of you might have heard of which is my workshop English from Muscus, which started a little bit over a year ago and I'm working on my fifth edition right now so I had the opportunity of um, of host like four four sessions um i brought a few pictures so you you have a better idea of of how fun uh they look and in in these uh sessions i have musicians non musicians choir singers e english students uh different levels so the workshop is given in portuguese because not everybody who who, who come to to the sessions they they are fluent in english but the, the most impressive thing is that even though they, they master the language, they are, they are fluent, they are very good at it. So they still 
produce non-target life forms, and they would like to learn those. So I, we, we do tons of uh, perception and production exercises. And through these workshops, I, I help them achieve, uh, achieve their goals. Something happened here with my, well, I was about to show you um, what, uh, because here are the, you know, like the, the first like sessions because the workshop is uh, divided into like three days. So we have like two days of like very intensive classes. And then we have like an open mic session to, you know, show uh, the results of the workshop. But apparently, apparently um, it, it didn't show here, but I, I might share with you like a video somehow, right? And okay, as I said, uh, the, this workshop is open for professional and amateur singers, musicians, or anyone who would like to uh, improve their pronunciation through singing, right? Um, I usually use some softwares. Uh, well, this one, I haven't used it yet because it's, it's rather new. It's called Pronunciation Power, and it, it is very similar to uh, the system that they have in uh, like the Sounds of Speech Iowa. But the difference is that they are using acoustic analysis, which I find really, really interesting. But I haven't piloted this yet. But I, but I'd like to, to, to show you. Um, okay. So as I'm working with musicians, I know there's a lot of discussion around like lingua franca, the importance of intelligibility over accuracy. But considering the the, the goal of the workshop is, I have to make not that I have to make, but some people, they they want to sound a bit more uh, target-like and they would like to to learn like the, the, the sounds that they are having a difficulty like perceiving and producing. So my, my goal for, for, for this workshop is to focus on accuracy, right? Because I cannot work on intelligibility here because they are not, for instance, they are not like fluent speakers. Some of them are, right? And for... For communication, I still considered intelligibility to be a, a better goal to to go for than accuracy. But in this case, I have people who have very little knowledge of English, and they want to sound more target-like. And I, I let's say, I offer them this opportunity. So these are the sounds because in two days there's not a lot that can be done. But I usually focus on on vowels, which. Uh, would be like most important for for communication in English and that we have like the most difficulty producing uh which is the e in a, a, a vowels right um and also the third the even though they do not cause a lot of problem for for communication right because if my goal was intelligibility here maybe I should you know not not focus so much because According to a, a concept that we use in, in pronunciation research named functional load, um, in, in the curriculum, it is more important to have or to teach sounds which, um, which contrast like uh, a greater number of lexical items in, in a language than pairs of sounds which uh, do not. And as we know, in English, the th and the the, the intradental fricatives, they they usually feature in um, in functional words such as prepositions, articles, right? So they are considered to have lower functional load. That is, they they are considered to be not as important as, for example, uh, this pair of vowel, specifically this one, like the e and the e. Uh, this pair is considered to have a higher, like a much higher functional load, because many words, many lexical items in English are contrasted by uh, by this pair, such as sheep, ship, leave, live, right? So here, uh, it might even affect uh, intelligibility, right? It's let's say it would be it would be uh, an accuracy aspect that would really affect intelligibility, and also because of the interference of spelling, uh, many people have uh, difficulties in producing like the ed. Uh, morpheme in simple past, right? So I I try to tackle that, but you know, like time time is short, and I really try to focus on 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 the vowels, and I let them make their choices, 
right? Because as, as a linguist and as a language educator, as a phonetician, I have to show them that those contrasts exist and I let them make their choices, whether they want to incorporate that, whether they feel comfortable, right? Because we cannot, in my opinion, make uh, choices for, for other people, right? As, you know, as a professional and as a researcher who work with, uh, you know, the, the, the sound system, the acquisition of, of sound system of different languages, I have to make um, learners aware that those sounds exist, right? Uh, okay, so yeah, so a much better picture now. Um, well, of the um, open mic sessions, right? Uh, this was last year, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't know if you probably can see some familiar faces here. Uh, we have Luciano Pepe, who is um, a very a well known musician here in our, in our city. He used to play at a band uh, called Cafe Com Blues, right? We have Ana Lu, who is singing at the Voice Kids right now, so he was also part of, of the workshop. There's also Claudia Hizo. Right, she is very uh, well known here in, in 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 town. She's a she's a voice coach. She's she's a mus music educator, and I think she even has a, a master's in, in in music. She's very very talented, among other talented uh, fellows and uh, uh, music enthusiasts as well. Um, um, people who sing in choirs and who just have a lot of fun singing. In, in English. Uh, well, I don't know how much time I've got. Maybe I I would like to share, since I know that everybody out there is enthusiastic about music, I don't know if the video is going to, to look so good, but maybe I can, try, I can try to show what one of these sessions sound like, right? I can do that. Well, for some reason, my my screen freezed. Okay, I don't know if you can still see it. Can everybody still see my screen? Hi, Robson. Yes, we can see and hear you pretty good. Well, I don't know if I stopped sharing. I'm a little bit. I think, lost yeah. Here, so let me see. We <laughs> can see and hear you pretty am good. I, am I still sharing my screen, Clarissa? Sorry for. Yes, just of yourself, not your presentation yet, right now. Uh, Do you okay, so, yeah, I yeah, I probably interrupted can it. You try again. Okay. But now, well, I sort of stopped sharing on purpose because, well, my computer is running a little, well, okay, this might be a little risky. Let me see here if it, if it works, because if the computer is low. Okay, no, I think, I think it's possible, right? Um, okay, let me see how well you can still, you can, you can, um, see and hear this right so i'm just going to show you how fun these sessions are so i think i'm going to show you the probably the most well-known participant in one of my section sessions which is uh, who is analu right so i hope you enjoy her performance i'm just going to show a little bit of what um these sound like okay so yeah i hope you you can all hear it Talking in my sleep at night, making myself crazy. Out of my mind, out of my mind. Trying to calculate, I'm hoping that they see me. Too many times, too many times. Oh, I didn't anticipate that at all. Chopping in my sleep, making myself crazy. 
out of my mind, out of my mind. Trying to avoid it on the page that we Too many times, too many times. Oh, he makes me feel like nobody else, nobody else. But my love, he just loves me so much myself. I do myself. You want to pick up the phone, you know you lose hope because you don't get along too. Don't let him in, you want to give him a hard game tree. Don't be afraid, you know you're gonna wake up in the morning. If you want to hear, you is getting over him. I got you rules, I caught him. I got you rules, I caught him. All right, this was just to give you an idea of what um, these sessions sound like. They sound like a lot of fun. They're not like a performance. This is better like the, let's say, um, I usually, yeah, we say open mic sessions because we, we want everybody to feel like relaxed and not carry so much about their pronunciation when they are like performing because they have like very short time to, you know, to work on, on, on possible, let's say non-native like forms or sounds that they misperceive. So um, this is just to, you know, show how fun they 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 had like during during the sessions and singing the songs that that they that they enjoy. Right. Um, okay, and picking up from where I left here, I'll share my PowerPoint presentation now to talk a little bit about my research. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it pretty good. Okay, yeah. that's good. All right, so that's the the bit that I that I would like to talk about my research and maybe a little bit of uh, the field, um, which I I see that is not as strong here in in Bahia as it is like like uh, like uh, where I'm I'm studying right now. Okay, so uh, as for my study, the main goal is to investigate the role uh, musical aptitude in terms of perception plays um, in the production of English uh, L2 vowels by Brazilian learners. For this study, I'll need about 60 participants right because it's going to be longitudinal so i need to have like 60 at the beginning so that i can have like at least let's say 20 or maybe 30 at the end of the study since i i'm still thinking about doing longitudinally so and i'm particularly interested in understanding um the correlation between musical aptitude and pronunciation when learners are starting because uh we see that the 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 more proficient you get the better your sound perception becomes i mean not 100 percent of cases but um the more experience you have with the language the more familiarized with it you get right so i'm i'm particularly interested in understanding how um early learners uh, uh perceive those uh those sounds and if um musical aptitude plays a role. So for this study, I'm thinking about choosing either only male or female participants to better control this variable. And this has to do not with sexism or anything like that, male or female, because this is going to help me analyze the, the, the data, which is going to be analyzed acoustically. And for uh, acoustics, so usually like uh, lower voices, uh, they have different frequencies compared to like, um, let's say higher voices. And usually male, males have um, usually uh, lower voices compared to uh, females, right? So I, I, well, put here male participants, but it will depend on, on, on the profile of participants that I, that I find. But as I'm gonna work with acoustics, so it's going to important to control 
that variable as well. And as many studies in language education and, and linguistics, it'll be important to um, to administer a background questionnaire in order to um, uh, be more familiarized with their, you know, both language, uh, education, and musical experience. I'll measure their musical aptitude more objectively, let's put it this way, uh, through the PROMS uh, test. And I'm also going to use a production, speech production task, which will be consisted of carrier words. And those will probably be my our carrier words. Some of you might be asking that maybe some of these words uh, are not familiar to uh, early learners, but I needed to, let's say, because of the kind of analysis that I'm going to use for this study, I needed to use items that were like phonetically uh, balanced to help in the analysis. So as you can see, uh, uh, most, um, most most target vowels, they are either uh, preceded or followed by a voiceless consonant because it, it makes it easier to identify the vowel. Well, except for, well, I have key, no, is a, is a, is a voiceless a voiceless sound. Yeah, so, yeah, so those those vowels, they are balanced in a way that, that uh, it, it can make like my task like easier to identify like the, the vowel frequencies because if I use, for instance, uh, a voice a voice consonant, uh, for example, instead of um, keep, let's say that I have uh, deed, for example, deed. So as those those uh, consonants they are voiced, sometimes it's it's difficult to determine where the 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 consonant stopped and and, and when the vowel started of course this is possible to do but you know uh most phoneticians agree that uh a voiceless phonetic environment makes analyzing vowels a lot easier so i'm not gonna try to do it differently right especially because this is going to be my first uh, experimental study so yeah so that was a methodological choice that i that i decided to make and also uh, in the last column you see distractors which are words that are not going to be analyzed in the study, but I'm going to prepare a list and, and make sure to include those. So uh, in order to distract my uh, the participants' attention from uh, the items that are going to be analyzed. Okay, so that was my, let's say my study design, if I if I don't change anything <laughs> um, in, the, in the coming, um, future, right? But okay, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the interface between like the, the science of phonetics and phonology and second language acquisition. So I'm basically talking, I think most of, of the audience here is formed by uh, linguists and language educators. So I think most of you are familiarized with the, the differences between phonetics and, and phonology. Usually, phonetics is um, concerned with uh, studying uh, human speech sounds, basically all sounds that we can produce. And phonology would be the study of, uh, let's say, the, the sounds that make up the inventory of, of a specific language and that um, like contrast meanings of, of words and are important for, let's say, for, for that for that system, right? There's a lot of discussion right now, which I think is really interesting about the, let's say about the, the limits between uh, phonetics and, and, and phonology. There are people who believe that phonemes do not exist and uh, that there is not, uh, let's say, a, a border separating them, that they are interconnected. So there are many interesting discussions nowadays in the, in the field of phonetics and uh, uh, phonology. Right, but I think for let's say methodological um, uh, purposes, uh, at least it helps me like separating phonetics from phonology. It helps me understand a few uh, uh, phenomena when I'm uh, looking across across languages. Um, okay, some uh, sound segments, let's put it this way, they can like the same sequences. They can work 
differently in languages. For example, the cha and the ja sequences, uh, they usually work as phones in Portuguese uh, because they do not contrast meaning. For example, if you contrast, like if you uh, produce like chia and tia, so you're basically produce, producing the same uh, the same word. You just have like variation. So you have like, it's it's more phonetic than phonological. Whereas if you have like cha and ta, depending on the word, so th th those can be uh, phonemes. I mean, even though what, what we hear is the phonetic realization, like uh, when cognitively speaking, we process those words as, as, as different, different words, like chair and tear, right? So uh, it, it, it might look like structuralist, but uh, when you are like studying different languages, learning different languages, this, um, let's say separating these two, like until a certain extent, it, it helps you understand phenomena in a, in a very interesting way. Um, but the most interesting fact about phonetics and phonology is even though we separate them methodologically, uh, let's say that uh, we cannot say that a phoneme and a phone are like two different entities, right? I, I believe that they are really uh, interconnected as some theories um, which, uh, which defend like that we develop language rather than we acquire. So I think this is really uh, interesting as well, right? That the patterns are, are changeable, but I think we need to have uh, a, a place to start from. So it's, for me, it's complicated just to destroy everything and say, oh, no, no, there's no phoning, there's no. So this, for me, maybe, maybe I still have to learn, but for me, it's still very, very uh, complicated. Okay, so um, the, the interface between phonetics and phonology and second language acquisition is um, usually uh, L2 speech uh, specialists, they are concerned with how uh, non-native speakers of a certain language, they perceive and produce sounds that do not exist uh, in their inventory. And uh, the critical period hypothesis is a hypothesis that is heavily criticized nowadays but because of this hypothesis, a lot of research was, was triggered because of this uh, hypothesis, right? So, um, but, but nowadays it's been, uh, it's been discussed that uh, a, criti a critical period hypothesis, for instance, would be, would be too limiting, right? So nowadays specialists usually say that there's like a sensitive, more of a sensitive period than a critical period. For, for language uh, acquisition, right? Because of uh, new findings. And um, uh, L2 speech sounds are usually governed by universal factors, uh, which have to do with their, you know, uh, manner and place of uh, articulation and also uh, cross-linguistic uh, patterns. What I, fi what I find really interesting about um, speech research in general is that uh, many of the, um, let's say, phonemes that we have difficulty in acquiring, um, native speakers of that language also um, have difficulties in, in acquiring, for instance, the th and the the uh, are usually, especially the th, the voiceless one, uh, is usually the last uh, phoneme that is acquired by uh, a, non, uh, a native speaker of of English, and I, I find this is really interesting, which might explain the difficulty that we might have in, uh, in acquiring these sounds. Well, I'm bringing vowels here now because uh, in my study, I intend to analyze vowels as you saw the, uh, the design. And uh, the reason why I chose vowels was that I believe that uh, Acquiring vowels in, in a different language, whatever it is, is a lot more difficult than consonants because um, vowels are are made by, you know, like uh, tongue high frontness and backness and lip rounding. So you, you don't have any degree of obstruction when, when, when producing vowel. So when I'm teaching consonants, I think it's a lot, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to, to teach uh, consonants because you can you can show them the place, but vowels it's all about the control of your of your tongue. So I, I find vowels 
um, very uh, challenging uh, to learn, develop, acquire if you don't have them in, in, in your language. So, and also uh, an, an author once said that vowels are, are some of the most uh, musical sounds that there are in language. So because of, of these few reasons, I decided to investigate vowels rather than, than consonants, right? Because I, I couldn't do it all. And I would like to mention uh, really briefly here some uh, ultra speech models that there are in uh, research now that, that studies have been focusing on. Um, there is one which is like an older one, which is called the Marketness Differential Hypothesis. And according to this uh, framework, um, uh, a sound that is, uh, let's say, th that is like more diff uh, sound in a second language that is more different than all the sounds in your first language will be um, will be more easily acquired according to this theory. And uh, for the perceptual and the speech learning models, so they they are different models, but they have. Um, they share a, a premise. They believe that the sounds, for example, a sound in a second language that is most similar to the sound in your first language is going to be, uh, uh, let's say, as, as difficult to be acquired because you won't be able to perceive the difference and you're going to produce a sound like similar to what you have in your uh, native language, for instance. Um, as for the E and the I, as in, live and, and, and live, for instance, th this pair would be more difficult according to these two uh, theories than the th and the the. So for for these authors, th and the would be more easily acquired because they are very different from your mother tongue sound inv inventory. But because the I is so similar to e, you'll have so much trouble perceiving it that you end up producing just something similar to what you already have. And uh, it, it makes it as difficult, right? So this, uh, what is interesting about these frameworks is that they do not, let's say, they say different things, but they sort of like complement each other because um, one another, because what the perceptual simulation model, the speech uh, model are saying is that not that the, you know, uh, different sounds are, you know, are the only ones which are difficult to acquire. But similar sounds in a second language, I mean, similar to your first language, can be uh, as as just as difficult to acquire because of the principle of of equivalence. And what I like about, especially Flega, is because he works with uh, with uh, immigrants. And the conclusion of his studies is that, um, uh, for example, he sort of, sort of like indirectly criticized the critical period hypothesis, right? So he does not believe in that. And he, one of the, let's say, the tenets of his model is that our cognitive capacities for like learning everything in life, including creating new sounds, categories in our cognition and producing them, this remains intact throughout one's. Um, lifespan like we just need to trigger that somehow yeah as i said according to the phlegas model uh adults maintain the phonetic abilities uh of their first language like throughout their whole lives e even though our in in our perception is sort of like dim diminishes right but it does not let's say it, it does not destroy. It doesn't mean that it, you will never be able to learn how to produce sounds you never produced like early in, in, in childhood because um, you you grew older, right? And um, okay, most studies uh, focus um, relying on this theory. They, they measured uh, like the, well, this would be <laughs> maybe I, I would need uh, more time to explain what a VO, VOT is, right? But it's, it's it's basically the you know the degree of aspiration in uh, in, 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 in in plosives, right? And there's many studies uh, on on vowel sounds and also uh, perception studies, right? 
Okay, some of the publications that I would like to recommend in case anyone is um, interested in knowing more about uh, second language acquisition research with a focus on ultra speed science, phonetics, and phonology, I would really recommend the, the third book, the one by uh, Bon and Monro, The Language Experience in Second Language Speech, which was um, the which was the, the book that inspired me to do my study. And also for whoever is more curious about the the, the relationship between, uh, let's say, music, language, and cognition. So there's um, this book by Patel, who is a cognitive researcher, and also one about the the origins of, of music. So it has more of a, an, an anthropological tone, but is very, very, very interesting, right? So yeah, those would be like the main publications that I would like recommend in case um you would like to know more about uh, the, the the topic right so yeah so these were some of the references that i'm using in my study and that i that i used to uh put together this presentation thank you so much i really hope you enjoyed and now we can go to our q a yes thank you Hobson. Yes. Thank you, Hobson. <laughs> can you Thank hear you us? Thank you so much, Claudia. Yes, yes. No, yeah. Okay. Very good. I think if we were uh, at Glaube Rocha, we would give you a nice big clap at this moment. <laughs> oh, that, that is nice. <laughs> I'll, I'll play the role right now. <laughs> but you've got lots of clap during the talk here. So I would yeah. like you to know. Yeah. Uh, please everybody help, please help me out with those. Please help yeah. me out with those because as I share my screen, I could only see my PowerPoint. So yeah, I couldn't get, uh, let's say, a sense of what the rea reaction of people was like. So. OK, you got great uh, feedback. A lot, I have some for you just so that you know people were paying attention. We have, like, like, like I said, loads of claps um, and hearts came from everybody. <laughs> uh, comments such as, <gasps> to listen to this brilliant talented Robson this research is very interesting I think this person was uh, referring to some of the data you were showing um, lots loads of virtual hugs too I think in time of COVID-19 people are sending lots of virtual hugs <laughs> yeah um, nice. great lecture uh, and everybody was excited about the little girl singing I forgot yeah. her name uh, Analu. Analu, yes. So if you are a friend with Analu, you can let her know that everybody appreciated her singing. There were lo lots of lovely, cute, adorable. Suede said her mom was a student of uh, us at Wesby sometime. <laughs> so um, you can let her know. By the way, I had a, I have a doubt, like, do you have kids join your workshops? Like, do you have any kids? Yes. Uh -huh. That was the first one that that we we had kids. That was the uh, like I said, I put together like four, three here in Bahia, mm -hmm. and one back in Florianópolis uh, when I was there. Okay. And yeah, in the second yeah, in the second one we had kids. Yeah, uh, and I was really okay. surprised that their parents, okay. you know, because we we hosted the the sessions at a school, and mm -hmm. and some of their parents wanted wanted the, their kids to to join. Oh, that's that's cool. That I bet they had a blast. I mean, they did. Yeah, they did. I, I think I the open microphone. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So these were some of the nice feedbacks you got. And do you intend to have kids uh, for your research uh, as your research participants as well? Mm, well, I wish I could, but as I said, I really have to to control that variable because of the the frequency. So. Uh, I'm, I'm basically going to work with like uh, young adults, right? Mm -hmm. From like 20, 40 at most, because okay. two, I mean, if, if they are from uh, a, a different sex because of the, the missions that I, because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, but if they are too young or too old, the frequencies change. So mm -hmm. I, I need to work with adults because, okay. because of, uh, you know, because of the, the methodology. So right. It, it's, yeah, it's I was thinking as you talked and showed Analu how that would be a research on itself, maybe. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, it'd be like, a, yeah, uh huh, could be. It could yeah. be. Uh, ah, I, I think people will come up with the questions now. I think Hobson told everybody that if you have comments or questions about some of the things he has touched based on, you can drop them on this chat box, right? So feel free to do that as we talk a little bit. Um, I have some that, let me see here. Uh, ah, you ask this one actually yourself. Does music aptitude make a better second lang language learner? You asked us at the beginning of your presentation. Yeah, so that you people feel like think about it, feedback or think about it. Right now that he mm -hmm. has told us so much about it, um, it's very interesting. All the reflections that you brought forward about um, how there are so many positive aspects about uh, having the skills, like mu music, musical skills, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How it can help but um and how it can also be developed because like you said not everybody's born an artist or yeah. a singer or um, i mean yeah an artist right so in this case as teachers it gives us a little bit of fresh air to think oh, okay so if i have a student that is willing to learn how to speak but at the same time cannot doesn't have i mean some people uh, it's easier for them to learn some things for other people they have different skills or different um, intelligences like gardner would say right but uh, mm -hmm. at the same time uh, they can still develop if they don't have the musical intelligence they can still develop work on it and if that would bring some type of benefit to the learning yeah. process, mm -hmm. Good, that would be I did. Sweet. I did. I, I don't consider. I don't see myself as a musically talented person, even though people right. just because I participated in a like singing group, people think that I have aptitude for music. So, like I said, I I, I never. I, I just took a sample. I, I never tested. To okay. be honest, I, I don't know if I, let's say, musically talented. I think okay. I'm musically skilled, considering that I had like some some training and some you know practical experience. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that that I am a, a musically talented person, and I don't think you need to be one, right? What I want to see is how they correlate, how musical aptitude, and also training, because this is going to be investigated by the questionnaire. So people are going to tell me um, the amount of training that they that that they had, like musical training. So that will be taken into consideration as well, because yeah. you, you you don't need to be musically, let's say, talented to you know like um, to acquire sounds because that's that's my focus like like mm -hmm. non-native sounds right so you, you yeah. don't need to be musically musically yeah. uh, talented but i would like to see the correlation between mm -hmm. such yeah, aptitude and, and also training and and pronunciation uh, uh more, more specifically speech production because yeah. I, I, I would not be able to do perception and production because of you know methodological issues right yeah, that, that 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 sounds very interesting. And like you said, look at the positive aspects that that could bring to the learning process. Like you mentioned a bunch of them, like it can help them identify the different sounds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, memory helps with memory activation of, like compare transfer from L1 to L2 and see how that goes. When mm -hmm. you're talking about the transfer, I was thinking uh, during these workshops, do you sometimes do some fun, do you, use like some funny ways to teach them specific sounds. <laughs> I do, I do. I usually, yeah, I, I think I think most uh, teachers will relate to this practice, okay. but uh, I usually, uh, uh, well, some some formal linguists condemn this practice, but mm -hmm. I think if it helps, it has to be used, right? So okay. uh, um, I think we have to be open. Um, that yeah my can you all hear me i think my screen freeze here a moment okay yeah i think mine did as well can you hear me Mara, can you hear me yes now i can yes i think we're back okay. i think we're back yeah, yeah. my we're my screen is still freeze i don't know if everybody can see us but if you can see and hear us i can hear you pretty good yeah it, it does freeze a little bit yeah we can still hear you pretty good um that's good yeah. that's good but can you can you see me or yes now I can see you yes now it's not frozen anymore. Um, oh, that's good. I have All right. a question here for you from 
from Silva. She is asking you, Robson, will you discuss topics such as intelligibility in English as a lingua franca in your thesis? Oh, okay, so I don't really have Robson. Oh, yes. Laís? Uh, hello, Laís. <laughs> uh, I think Robson is uh, offline for a moment. Let's mm -hmm. wait for him. Okay. But uh, I'd like to wait, uh, use this moment to ask everybody to answer the session survey. So uh, we're going to use this as an attendance list. Uh, so if you did not answer it yet, please do it now. We are sharing the link on the comment box. And uh, I hope everybody can use this, this moment to, to fill in and, and uh, use the information that, we, uh, that you provide in your registration process, okay? So we are going to wait for Hobson to come back. We hope he can back very quickly. Yeah, uh, maybe you can tell them about the next lecture because there is a, a next one coming up Monday, right? Yes, I'm going to show add uh, Professor Diogenes to the screen. Okay, that would be a good time to invite everybody to please come back. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Okay, so uh, I have Robinson here too. Sorry guys, I don't know, something went wrong with the connection. No problem. Yeah. Okay. What were we? <laughs> uh, the first question is from Daniel Vasconcelos. I'm going to put on the screen and Paris is going sure. to continue. Okay, the first question from Daniel. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. How important is it to work in ELT classes with songs from non-hegemonic English-speaking countries? How to teach pronunciation in these cases? That's from Daniel. Um, Daniel, thank you for asking. And I, yeah, Daniel, he's a fellow linguist. He's a he's a professor at uh, Ufuba, and yeah, uh, he's he's a fellow uh, linguist friend of mine. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. I never thought about that, and it's really interesting that you that you brought this this issue because the thing is, I usually try to work with songs that people usually re relate to. I mean, as for their personal uh, songs in my workshops, they bring their songs, right? So like I said, I'm, I'm not making choices. I only have two days. So mm -hmm. I, I, I really, uh, let's say, I, I could try to do an, an experience, but I usually try to, to choose songs that they can relate to, even if it's a song that I don't like very much, mm -hmm. but it just makes easier. Uh, for, for them, I mean, when when I choose, I usually uh, choose like two songs should be sung in group. So I, I usually uh, choose something that I that I understand that they are more like familiarized, right? But ah, but but you're saying like in, in ELT classes, yes, yes, I think it's really important. I do that for like for example, I, I also teach Italian besides English, so I, I'm I, I try to bring like variation. For example, I. Uh, I also uh, I, I I already brought like to my Italian students a song in in an Italian dialect. So I try mm -hmm. to like in class I try to uh, provide these uh, these experiences. But to be honest, for like like classes I've been like working like mostly like mainstream, right? But uh, that that's a good food for thought, right? To bring a little bit more like uh, variety in 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 music. So I, I never uh took that into like great consideration but i, I think it's uh it's uh, an, an interesting thing that i should you know even as a phonetician we've been looking at even though this is not like my re uh research uh focus but yeah i i i really appreciate people who are doing it right but mm -hmm. i i confess i have to do it a little bit more 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 often yeah I guess it might be a little bit to part of the culture that the like the the songs, the music we have available do come from mm -hmm. uh, certain countries, right? And then if you look uh, to like elementary, high school students, uh, maybe some of them might not even be aware that English is also spoken in some other countries. Uh -huh. 
than, for example, the United States or England, right? Um, so it, it, it goes, I mean, he was talking about ELT classes, but looking back to uh, like even the regular schools, um, that's also something that maybe that might influence. The, like if you ask them to choose, uh, their choices are limited to what they know mm -hmm. and what they are exposed to or what's available for them at that point, right? Exactly. I think I think it would not be difficult to bring like, for example, you can, well, I can't think of any title right now, but I think you could bring like a song, like a modern song to, mm -hmm. to discuss like Black English, right? right. So that, you, that you find in, in, in rap and like in black music. Yeah, I, I don't remember if I ever did that, but for example, this would be a way uh, to do it. And I think, yes, I think it's important to to to, to show such uh, variety, you know, uh, across different like musical genres and also like different different dialects, right? I confess I don't do this all uh, like e every time, like I rarely do it, but I confess that I have to include that a little bit more in my, pra in, in, in my practice. But mm -hmm. I don't think I would be doing that the whole time because I think mm -hmm. that I'd be confusing my students because I, I would mm -hmm. have to teach them like like a pattern of pronunciation that I don't master. So mm -hmm. I would be confusing like because it, this is my opinion. Okay, everybody is entitled to their own opinion. But my mm -hmm. opinion is that if you if you teach like too much variation, I think you could, you you'll get confused. And this yeah. is something that I know it is like learning languages other than English because this mm -hmm. is an exercise that we all should do, right? I don't know if you're going yeah. if you're learning if, if you're learning like Mandarin Chinese if if you're learning like the different dialects of course it's important to know that there is variation uh, an example yeah. here and there and making students aware that you know of all the political connotations that there are uh, behind language I think it's really important to make them aware of all that but to, you know to teach all that I wouldn't be able to and I think by my practice I would be confusing myself and my students and I would be you know, teaching something that I do not really master. But bringing an example here and there, I think it's really uh, important to yes. show that even though we choose to to teach a certain uh, pattern, because let's say usually North American we English is more like that. prevalent mm -hmm. on the side of the ocean and sometimes we were more focused on it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's important to show uh, variation like to a certain extent. But mm -hmm. sometimes I, I, I'm afraid like to confuse myself and my students and to be like, teaching like something that I that I uh, don't like like master right I don't know if I I hope yeah. to have answered your question yeah. Daniel. <laughs> I think you did. yeah you made a think you gave us like you said food for thought um it, it'll yeah. be challenging I think not just for you but for any English teacher uh to look yeah. at the variations that there are out there but also like you said very important to let people know that there are variations that are rolled Englishes like David Crystal always mm -hmm. kind of has, right and they should I mean if they are more interested maybe they can go and look for more information about like these places too yeah mm -hmm. very good yes language is power isn't it <laughs> yes <laughs> we have right. and by the way this is this is just my opinion you don't have to to agree with me I think everybody should be respected um Yes. and have their, their opinion uh, uh, respected as well, right? So I'm not trying right. to uh, colonize anybody. I'm not trying to convince anybody of what what, what uh, your practice uh, should be like, right? right. Because yeah. I think we, especially like with, with time, like we are mature, especially mm -hmm. when we're doing research, like uh, I've been able to look at both sides and we we make choices and okay. it does not have to be like black and white. You can choose yes. gray and some of, your practices right. are going to be a little, you know, less gray, more gray, right? right. It's all yeah. about in between places and also uh, to, you know, let, let people make uh, their choices. And I believe that I, like for the moment, uh, I made mine. It doesn't mean that I'm going to, I'm not going to change my mind, right? Exactly. But right. Uh, this, uh, the choices I m made for now was based on the experiences that I that, uh, that I've been through throughout this like 17 years, like mm -hmm. teaching um, English, for instance, and also based on, on, on the few years um, that, I'm, that I'm doing research and listening okay. to like different specialists, different people, right? Yeah. Because for me, it's too difficult like to, to make choices and listening just to like one, one, one version of the story, right? Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really important when you have both and you make your own choices because when I when I 
st uh, started research, the feeling that I have, right? This is this mm -hmm. is um, this is constructive criticism, is that sometimes I feel that some choices are already made for us. Mm -hmm. No, here it is. Here mm -hmm. how English should be taught. Here, right? I think mm -hmm. that uh, as language educators, we have to be free to make our own choices, even if yeah. they are more or less um, decolonizing dec uh, decolonizing practices, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's good to hear that, that there will be challenges out there. And like you said, we'll be making choices as we go. And also based on our experiences, right? We always depart from somewhere. And I guess mm -hmm. that shows the light and the different research, like you said, will bring different perspectives and views to the table, which is good. Maybe we won't yes, look at something absolutely. and then we'll feel like, oh my God, I could have looked at that. But then other people will sh bring that up and that's, that will keep the conversation going for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah, and answering Daniel, I think. Yeah. And Daniel also said, great presentation, my dear friend. <laughs> okay, so now we'll go skip to Sue Silva. She also had a question like, will you discuss topics such as intelligibility in English as lingua franca in your thesis? No, no, because, um, well, as I probably mentioned uh, earlier, uh, my focus is really on, on accuracy, right? Because this is a study on, on language, uh, second language acquisition and cognition and effects of experience, right? But in this case, um, I, I'm going to focus more on accuracy rather than uh, intelligibility. But intelligibility can be uh, researched in a sec, uh, L2 speech research, for instance. I think that lingua franca is really interesting when you are studying how um, individuals from different linguistic backgrounds, they perceive mm -hmm. sounds in English and the difficulties that they have. So in that case, you can have a more, uh, let's say, lingua franca approach when you are investigating perception. But as I'm investigating production, mm -hmm. so we usually go for, um, for for example, we, we analyze outro speech production according to a certain stand standard that we, we choose because you cannot, you, well, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it would be really difficult to carry out uh, uh, research, uh, you know, comparing uh, I don't know, non-native and non-native, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm really interested in, in comparing, right? Not that you have to become a native speaker. This is not, uh, I hope I'm not misunderstood, mm -hmm. but you need to have like, uh, like, like a point of comparison, right? Mm -hmm. I know this is yeah. quite controversial and a lot of people in the audience will not agree with me. You don't have to, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, and not that I, I'm not yeah. expecting yeah. that my students yeah. become yeah. native speakers. Where it goes, yes. As yeah, well, right? Before, right? You're gonna make some choices and see where it takes you. Exactly, right? and for phonetics and uh, for speech for investigating speech production, you need to have like like a stand uh, like a like a standard. Okay. You do, you do need. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and no, yeah. Uh, I I had lingua franca for my uh, for my PhD, oh, not not PhD, but for my master's thesis, mm -hmm. I I had lingua franca because I. I studied the experiences of people who went uh, to different countries and the impact of those in interactions uh, in their second language identity. So for that study, I, uh, the concept of English as an international language or lingua franca was, was uh, really important because it was more of an anthro anthropological study uh, and I was investigating like second language identities. So in that case, I was investigating, ling uh, let's say, lingua franca context. Right now, I made a different uh, choice and I'm investigating accuracy. I have no native and I have native. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about accuracy, I thought that was very cool when you said, um, I think you showed something about like the importance of uh, looking at, at, at trying to reach some accurate, some aspects of accuracy. Because like you said, what is native speaker? What is perfect? I mean, there's no perfect, right? Mm -hmm. but, for for like to be understandable um or uh, it, it would be important to have some level of accuracy in letting them decide or choose so you said something like that yeah what let them decide with, uh, yes what yeah. to do for instance i'm not going to teach my uh, like a specific student the and the, no well i'm still going to teach them but I'm mm -hmm. not going to focus on that if 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 it's not their choice because i know that this pair the and the uh, mm -hmm. does, does not implicate in problems for communication. So I, I, I don't need to overemphasize and, right, teach, yeah. and, and teach them that, right? Because yeah. some students are already refuse. So when they refuse, I, 
I I, I just show that it exists and they make their choice. I think this is, exactly. I, I think this is important. Very important, yeah. Once um, Paulo Freire said that teaching our students the standard uh, is empowering them. It doesn't mean that they'll have to speak, like you said, uh, paying attention to mm -hmm. accuracy all the time or follow what you teach exactly how it is, but empowering them, yeah, about because... teaching them what it is called standard to that time. Uh, during exactly. That time. They, they, they have to know what it is. And teaching accuracy does not necessarily mean like overemphasis. I'm not saying that accuracy is more important than intelligibility. Uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not instructing teachers to teach accuracy to the point of like losing like even fluency, cadency, uh, prosody, right? I think that, that, mm -hmm. that there must be a balance uh, among all, all these aspects in, uh, in, in, in pronunciation teaching, right? I don't have like a final answer, right? No. I just, nobody I just, <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody does. But I, yeah. I really enjoy the, the, even though I'm not going to work with uh, Lingua Franca, English as a Lingua Franca in my study, I really enjoy the, 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 the discussions and I think they're really pertinent. But uh, methodologically wise, you, you cannot really use it in, in, in every study but it's really interesting to see the studies that can uh, um, uh, use the, this concept, uh, uh, whether like more like language teaching or more like uh, acquisition, second language acquisition studies. Okay, Hob, so I think we'll call it um, uh, a day and we'd just like to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and ideas and your research uh, ideas being developing, it just, um, fills our head with lots of things to think about. And we would, oh, somebody, I think you have more comments and a few more questions, but I think Laís <laughs> said, yes, uh, the top hour. So uh, we would just like to thank you again for coming and for talking to us today and sharing uh, your studies and your interests. And I think we all have enjoyed it so much and it's just a lot of things for us to process and to uh -huh. the conversation rolling in different ways. Like you said, everybody can bring something and add to it, right? And shed light where we haven't looked at before. So thank you very much for coming and sharing everything with us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Gladys. It's, it's uh, really a joy to get to speak to so many um, teachers, language educators, uh, students mm -hmm. who are um, interesting knowing more about about the topic. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know if I if w whatever I, I said here was expected unexpected. But I hope you <laughs> you got to enjoy a little bit of what I'm doing because I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm having um, a great time. Yeah, as we can see, you are um, in love with your research <laughs> and your ideas right now, and we hope you continue them and you can share more and more with us sometime okay yeah absolutely yeah thank you so much Clara. i hope you can have it's access been, been to and questions uh yeah. later i don't know if we can copy and paste okay I, this is the last question i think there is no problem if we do answer it very quickly for okay. It. okay this is the last one we have only this question and then we close thank you uh, okay okay, okay. So I, uh, said we have one more question from Arthur, right? Yes. Uh, is there any yes. relation uh -huh. between musical experience and language acquisition? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, as I as I presented at the beginning of my my talk, yeah, there was uh, like a never growing number of studies showing like a like let's say a, a positive like correlation, right? It's not like uh, like cause effect. Like, if, okay, if you are like musically skilled or talented, you're going to, uh, you know, master sounds of a non-native language, uh, let's say more effectively than, than a, than a non-musician. But there has been research evidence showing a correlation between uh, musical experience, not only aptitude, but also musical experience and, and language acquisition in general, especially, um, especially in the, the sound sound aspect of, of language. Yes, but it's not something that we can say, oh, um, yeah, what, what we can say is that uh, music, 
co-aptitude and, and, and music skill training can be a good predictor of, of second language acquisition, such as, uh, I don't know, maybe language engagement, motivation, and so many other variables and predictors as well. But I'm particularly interested in looking at, at, at that one because I, what, what I know is from research that I read, but I don't, I don't have my data yet to, to, let's say, answer that question myself, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I think you did touch base on uh, like some of the research being con uh, that were was uh, already uh, conducted about how it helps in some ways, right? Like the mm -hmm. positive aspects that music can bring to the learning experience. Uh, you highlighted yeah. the thing about especially especially uh, for yeah, especially for pro for production for production. pronunciation, mm -hmm. not so much for perceiving. Okay, well, at least that's what one of the previous study that I that I mentioned here concluded. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for sharing, Hobson. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you, Arthur, for your last question. Hello, G. Can you hear right. us? Yes, yes, I can hear yes. you. Okay. All right. Is Laís there? I don't I see Laís. So. Yes. It's coming. Okay, you are. All right. Okay, Robson, thank you very much for this very nice lecture. Okay. Um, I guess this you're the pioneer of this kind of study in Brazil, aren't you? Uh, well, I, I'm not really sure, but yeah, it, it looks like it's going to be like the first one, at yeah. least in second language acquisition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. That's excellent. Uh, I do have a question, but I think we are running out of time. <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible for someone who doesn't have any theoretical knowledge of the language, like who doesn't know anything about minimal pairs and uh, vowel sounds, mm -hmm. uh, to sing a song in the correct way just by yeah. listening to someone? Is it? Okay, you understand yes. my question? Okay. Yeah, I did. I did. That's that's a very that's a very good that's a very good question. Yeah, one of my band band members used to sing like English very well, even though he does not speak English. Like I would say that he he has like an, an, an ear for 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 language. Yeah, I, I I've seen that happen uh, before. The same way that I that I've seen, for example, people who have musical skills. It's really interesting because we, we have that happening. So I, I've seen like a few examples in practice, but we also have people who are like musical skilled and their pronunciation is not so accurate. So I've seen mm, people who li like, uh, I don't know about their musical aptitude, but people who know how to play an instrument, right? And mm. people who even have like uh, uh, an intermediate level of, of English, they are yeah. fluent, they are very good at English, but they are not, their, their pronunciation is not so accurate, but they mm. have musical skill, so yeah. Yeah, so it's possible, right? Good. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, based on what I've observed. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you once again, uh, Clarissa. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much for your moderation of the way you conducted the um, the talk. It was very interesting, you know, contributing. Uh, thank you. Okay, to the topic and make some nice comments too. And. Uh, Next time, we're going to have our sixth lecture, and it's going to be delivered by someone by the name of Karen Malkovich. She is a retired school teacher from Harrisburg, Illinois, and she is currently teaching at a community college in Harrisburg. Okay, mm -hmm. and after that, our lectures are going to be can have two round tables in the Spanish and then two lectures in uh, uh, French. You'll have two round tables in, in uh, Libra, sign language. And the last two are gonna be some, we can have some special lectures. They don't have anything to do with the topic of linguistics, applied linguistics and the FL teaching. We're gonna be talking about law, okay? They're gonna be delivered by a judge uh, once by a judge, they are going by a prosecutor. So they're going to be very, very interesting too, although they do not belong to the this topic that we are we are have been working on. But they're going to be interesting. 
Okay, thank you, Laís, thank Jason, and thank everybody again for coming. And I hope to see you again next week. Okay, bye bye. Take care. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye.